us well. Barrett, um, we welcome you with open arms. It's, it's so great to have you here. Um, uh, thanks to Barrett, maybe I should say that we, we became close friends through the years. I was one of her students once and we uh, kept in contact. Through uh, Barrett, I became a member of AIC. And thanks to her question in Tokyo, why not make a color association Belgium, uh, ICA Belgium was founded. So thank you very much, Barrett. So you can see how, what, which, which influence you, you have had. And now we are six years later and, and um, uh, still enjoying our work. Um, so I would like to introduce Barrett. Barrett Bergström is a color specialist and educator in color and color scheme in her own business. Barrett Color Talks since 2016. She was employed by NCS Color AB from 1990 to 2016. She was the managing director for Color Academy between 91 and 2012. NCS Color Academy organizes and develops color courses in color theory and color design for professionals. Barrett has long experience of giving color courses and presentations worldwide in NCS on a very high level. She has held courses in color design for countless color professionals and has conducted color studies at university level worldwide. She has also carried out color research projects. The purpose of one was to inform professional colorists about useful results from Swedish color research work. This was, this was published in a booklet, Color Choices, a practitioner's guide to color scheming and design in Swedish and English in 96, 2007 and 2008. Furthermore, she was an administrator in the Color Science Foundation between 91 and 97, and was responsible for granting funding for different color research projects within the field of color. Barrett has been a member of AIC Executive Committee between 2006 and 2021. She was the president of AIC 2010 to 2013 and the chairperson of the AIC study group on color education between 98 and 2009. AIC is an international color association that is comprised of over 28 color associations from around the world. She has been the secretary of the Swedish Color Center Foundation since 91. So, Barrett, we are very lo uh, looking forward to your talk, and uh, I'm personally also very curious about, because I have your booklet, and now there's a new booklet to see the changes you have made. So, the floor is yours, Barrett. Thank you very much. I make, make sure of this one. Okay. So, I am very honored to that you have invited me for this morning session talk. And I don't wear the pyjamas as you said I could have, <laughs> almost no. no. But uh, when I left, uh, uh, when I left NCS Keller as employee after 26 years, I actually started to find my thoughts of, I would like to do a book because I have about 30 years of color education. Maybe I could put that in a book. But that took longer time than I had expected, I must say. But now it's actually, oh, if I, I, don't, I don't know why next picture doesn't come. Let's see, now it comes. But uh, now I finally, the one is finished. The Swedish one is, uh, is finished uh, because they, the educator, the publisher, student, student literature, which means it's, literature for students, for universities and in school uh, uh, education. So I thought I just had a telephone call and I asked, are you interested in color? Because you don't have any of the books. It's about light, but not about color. Yes, we are. So it took just a couple of days <laughs> that they decided to publish my book. And then they wanted to have it first in Swedish. So I wrote it first in English, and then I had to translate it into Swedish, which was very difficult. <laughs> and you, it, it, when you are so in one language, then you should have it to Swedish. But now the Swedish is ready. Uh, and it's about that, I mean, there are so 
few things affect us some, as much as color and it plays a visual part in our surroundings, whether in work, in public spaces and or in our home. And choosing the right color is a necessary means of achieving the side effects in color schemes and design. And there are of course no given rules concerning what is right or wrong and what is beautiful or ugly, but some guidance can still be offered about color schemes. And there's knowledge to be gained from our color research. And that is a big point here that I wanted to have everything which are written in this book has uh, that its background in color research. So I know it's scientifically good <laughs> things I tell you. And many people in the color society has assisted me with this book, like Byron Michelides from UK and Turban Leike from Lund in Sweden and Bengt Dahlin and Lena Andersson, a color designer and, good, and a good friend and Greta Smedal and Gina Anglin from Norway also. And then I had a good help of, with, from Maggi Maggio about the titles, which would be a good one in English. And also Dimitri Milunas from, from the UK. With all, all of these people, I have got valuable comments uh, about my material and what I have been written. Okay, so we go straight on to the book. So Color Choice is a practitioner's guide to designing color schemes. So this one is I will do my last part of this book uh, big, uh, next week, and then it will probably be ready in mid of, December, mid of November, because it will take one month to print the book. So we are finally, but I will, I have to, I have it uh, in English, so that's why I'm presenting it, but sometimes I have small pictures from the book, just to show you how the book looks like as well, okay. And the content, I could say there are in three focus areas. First, it's about color knowledge, the base that you have to know about color. That is chapter one to four, with color as a field of research and education, and our need of color and color systems and the NCS system. Of course, that is the language I have for color. So that's why this is the language, color language I use in the book because it's also built on how visually perceived colors. And then we have methods and approaches in practice, chapter five to eight with color combination, which is much larger than the old edition and color naming and what color signify and the human impact of color. And then I also have a new um, chapter, which is sensibility of room color and color inspiration, practical examples. And I also have added a color glossary in the end. So that's the new things compared to the old one that Jeanette have, has. And the aim of this book is to acquire both wider and deeper knowledge concerning an efficient way of choosing color for the design of our surroundings. It's a knowledge book with inspirational examples and knowledge gained from color research and practitioners in color design. And the examples given in this publication are intended to shed light on methods and examples applicable in color schemes and design, product and industrial design, all environments and culture. And it's a visual approach to color. That is very important. It's not all of how you mix color. And when it comes to the second chapter, now the title is, sorry. Color as a field of research and education. It seems like, at least here in Sweden, in educa color education on the architect school, uh, it's not so much about color actually. So that's why I think it's important to um, also this is a book for architects because sometimes in some schools in the architect of Stockholm, for instance, they don't have anything that's named color. <laughs> so that's very strange actually. So that's why I think it's important. And if there is no education in color, there will be no color research in color either. So they are very important issues. So much of the color research has centered on the way in which people perceive, experience, and react to color, whether or not they share the same values. And we have to like 
discrimination and identification of colors. In phenomenological color research, the sense of color serves to distinguish for the purpose of discovery and to identify in order to understand. It's a matter of identifying color and distinguishing between them. These are the important thing. So I, I mean, I can't show you the whole book, but I try to make some examples from different chapters. So this is then chapter one. And like we need education in color. You, it's like the in the Greek antique, they all say, some people say, oh, the, it was white, but the antique was not white at all. It was very colorful and that is good to learn about because I think the white was so important in the 1940s and so on. So, okay, they thought it was white, but not. And this is actually from Australia. Yeah, this is what uh, Nick probably know. Uh, the Queen Victoria building in Sydney, and it's a shopping center built 1898 by George McRae. But there was a new opening in 2009 with a lot of colors, very colorful and appealing center. It was the same year that we had the uh, con Congress in Australia, 2009. So it was brand new when we were there. And when it comes to our need for color, chapter second, because color tells us things, beautifies and arouses our feelings. And we see color as a sort of information in every waking moment. And the number of colors distinguished by simultaneous comparative, uh, uh, comparative observation is 10 million. That's when you, I can't point out, no, I have this one. I mean, if we look at this one and that one, they look, okay, They I can't see any big difference. I can't see any difference, but if I put them together, then I can see the differences. And then we are see up to 10 million. But this one we can see, okay, it's blue and that is more to purple. So this number of colors that we can identify, they are smaller, they is only 20,000. But what is color then? Then I go back to uh, Lars Schivik because he says, the only truly correct definition of color. Color is what we see as color. And when we have the sky like this, I mean, no, the sky is not red like that. I mean, but we see the color. So the sky is not blue in this case. Color is what we see. And then I also show, to, uh, inform about, of course, about our color perception and also different modes of appearance, like colors may be perceived not only belonging to the surface of the object, colors also may appear in other modes like volume color, luminous color, illuminant color, and film color. Film color is the color of the sky. And then we have defective color vision. And during all these years I giving color courses, we always start with the one, this exercise going from start with any color and then take the most similar color to the first one and the third one, most similar to the second one and so on. So we get a rather nice color circle actually. And then I can see, go and look around on the students I have, <laughs> participants, and I can see, oh, then you have to be very careful. Um, but do you see that is more green and that is orange, yellow. Can you see that? No, no, they can't see that, okay? <laughs> and then I always get the same pattern. It's the same order if, uh, I have met uh, many times. I met one in Chicago and I met the same in China and so on. So it's very fantastic that they, it's very important that we know that people with red and green deficiency see color actually like this. But Van was very happy because when I show his, after the lesson, he said, Barry, thank you very much. Yes, but you have given me a color language. He only looked at the backside on the color surface. <laughs> then he, he could explain that, okay, you think that is too, you want to have it more bluish. Okay, instead of our ATB, I can, we can take this one R90B. So actually that was practical for him. 
but uh, then of course the lingon berries are very difficult to see. So a green pattern with red small uh, signs or that's no good, no good pattern for many people. And our ATM machine was once that combination which was very strange for a short time and we changed it. And that we cost a lot of money in Marseille. So we have to be aware of that. And then we have the color systems like color sample collections, which are no system, but they are collections of color. And different color systems where we have color mixing, color appearance system. And uh, then also in, when you come to the chapter about color appearance system, I also make a quick comparison between Mansell and NCS. Both are local system with methods of describing colors and both are the insight that color is a visual phenomenon. <laughs> And then we talk about the attributes and that um, also the color differences are defined by C-Lab for Mansell, but it's only 100% visual for NCS, so that's a different. But I make this pyramid to show that the, you have on the top NCS, Dean, Mansell, OSA, UCS, scientific system based partially or totally on the visual perception of colors. And then you have instrument based like C, CIE, C Lab, Calicur. And then you have production driven like RGB, SMIC, Phantom, and so on. And color collection, which could be uh, AFNOR and the RAL K7, and safety colors, color names, and so on. <clears throat> and then in chapter four, we have the NCS system. And of course, I talk about the background history and the origin. And we talk from Forsyth 1611 to hearing 1874 and to the NCS system, which was already 1978. Actually, it was a rather funny, strange, strange thing because Forsyth, he, he was, uh, they said he is like, kind of mad person and he had all this book which he write about colors and they didn't take any notice to it no no there's nothing to have so it was never published but then there was a student at Uppsala who was interested in in this language and he actually translated all this to this old Swedish to to new Swedish and then there was a journalist who contacted on the short and said, do you know about this? No. So it's fantastic, like 350 years later, if we got used to his book of Fossius. And then you have the structure of the system and you have now a new edition of the Atlas. So now it is shown with 2050 color samples. And uh, the Atlas is an illustration of the system. It's not the system because the system shows you all colors that we can see, perceive. But uh, the Atlas is an illustration to the system with now 2050 color. And I don't know if you all are familiar with NCS or if I should make this short presentation because I will talk about the notation. So. What do you think? Should I show them, Jeanette? Do you think so? Yes, just show because maybe not everyone knows. No, probably no. a lot do, but for the people who don't. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, yes, please. So we are we we are we have six elementary colors like white and black and yellow, red, blue, and green. These are the uh, you can see here: white, black, yellow, red, blue, green, and they are placed in a three-dimensional model. And if, if with this model make a horizontal projection, we will get a circle like you see here. We go from yellow, red, blue, green. And then we can also, uh, if we make a vertical projection, then we will get a triangle like this. And then we have the notation because in the triangle that shows the nuance of the color if it's uh, high chromatic, if it's blackish, if it's white, if it's light or dark and so on. And then in the, uh, in the color circle, that is the different color families. 
And we have here 40, 50 R70 B. That tells you exactly how that color looks like. It says, okay, is 40% of blackness. Then we go up here and see it says, it says 40, you have to believe me. And then we go down here and then we have 50, which is the chromaticness. So it's halfway to 100% chromatic. And then we have um, uh, the U, which is uh, R70B. So it's 70% blue and 30% red. So this means red, 70% blue, and it's compared to 100% blue and 100% red. Okay, I think I, I, I leave it there. And if you have questions, just ask me. And also one thing that is important for me, I think it's, we have then 2,050 color samples to look at and to choose among. And sometimes when you are going to analyze a textile or something and you find, but it's not that color and not that one, which one is it? What shall I, can I put a notation on it? Sorry. And it, it's actually what you can do because if you say, okay, it's 2040 Y50R, uh, but that is, it should be more chromatic. It should be stronger, but 250 is too strong. So for your sake, you can, okay, it's actually in between here. So 245 Y50R, that one is perfect. And that is good to also note for your own notes. But you, uh, so, so you can actually interpolate and imagine how that color looks like. And that is an advantage of the system when it's put in this visual way, shown in this vis visual way. Then we have chapter five, which is about color combinations. And in that chapter, we have first, I start with, col with some color theories and complementary colors and NCS color areas and categories, and then color similarities and lightness contrast and lightness contrast requirements, which is very uh, the law in many European countries, and border distinctness and legibility and color compositions. That is, and then I will give you some, uh, some part of this chapter to you. And uh, a lot of different theories have been developed in order to find the most beautiful and suitable color combination. And some of them have a background in pigment mixtures, like we have in, in this uh, book, I show you uh, talk about Goethe and Itten, for instance. We have also Chevrolet, also but I don't, I, I, I have choose just uh, Goethe and Itten. And some of them have the background in pigment, uh, uh, and when they have the background in pigments mixtures, then the red uh, after image of the red one is supposed to be, you know, the green one. But if this is a red that we have to choose, we are not sure about it, but okay, it could be that one. But the after image will not be as strong as this because the after image will be like, a light, very lightish color. And I actually have some shown in the book about that. So you can make your own experiment. Like if you look at this one, then, and then you, you just look at that red one, then you see for, uh, for 30 seconds, and then you look in the book and it will be appear about like this one. So it's a very lightish one light green color and then you have the blue and orange and yellow and purple and if you talk about I mean if I look at this one then I get this color as an after image but not as that strong green as a red one and so it's a special point where we can find the after image because NCS is not constructed according to uh, pigments because so you can't go like this from the red 
to the green. That's not the arteriomyelitis. So they all pass through this point. So if I we take a red one, it will go to B60 gene. But I mean, if you want to make a complementary color combination, don't take these strong ones. I mean, this uh, is a nice green and then you have an, another red one. So this is kind, a kind of complementary uh, composition. And then you have this color categories uh, theme. Uh, Jeanette like it very much. <laughs> It's rather complicated actually, because here you have to follow the circle. You have uh, greenish yellow here, and here you have uh, reddish yellow, and here you have uh, uh, blue, uh, yellow is red, and here you have uh, blue is red, and so on. So it's very nice actually. We had a company who had thread, and they didn't know if they had thread all over in the color. Uh, color world. So they, we could just analyze it and we saw, okay, you don't have so many here, but you have no one here. So you have to add that to your thread. Then you, you get a good order of all. And, can you, and you can see if you, uh, if you have color where it should be in the whole world or not. And then we have the categories of uh, you, which I talked a little bit about uh, in that scheme, like greenish yellow, reddish yellow, yellowish red, bluish red, reddish blue, greenish blue, and bluish green, and yellowish green, and so on. So that is where you are in the families. And then we have uh, the nuances, and that was actually Paul Green Armitage in. Perth, Australia, we have had a lot of discussions about that. And now this is in Swedish, so I will have an English one here. So we have up here, we have the whiteness dominance. So we have pale colors and we have dull pale colors because they have more blackness than this one, which are more dramatic. And then you have this area, which is a strong, colors, vivid colors, where we have bright colors, and four strong colors. And then we have these dark colors, where we have uh, dark and dark dull. And in these areas, we have dull pale colors, we have uh, dull colors, we have uh, dull dark colors. And here in the middle, we have muted colors. They have the, the distance to chromaticness and distance to whiteness and distance to blackness is the same. Very nice colors, actually, I must say. And here we have light colors. Uh, so this is kind of colors which are not so blackish. And here we have more strong and darker colors. And here we have more grayish colors. So that was the way of communicate with the colors. So we have names every area. And this is uh, like a page in the book where we can see where I'm chosen colors with the same hues from the same family, the blues, the bluish family. And also sometimes if you take color from the same family, sometimes you need an accent color, which is an opposite color, perhaps. And color with the same new ones, then we are in the same place in the triangle but different use families. And then we have kind of the same blackness. And you can see they, they have something in common which makes them more harmonious. And, and that is what uh, the research I tried to, that when we can see that the colors have something in common, then we find them more harmonious than others. And then we have kind of the same chromaticness, but they are in different they are here, so they are only 10 in chromaticness, I think it was. Yes, there are 10 in chromaticness. So this is how a page look in the book, you can see.
And then we also have color with the same whiteness, which is perhaps not that you don't, uh, I don't think so many people choose color with the same whiteness, but it's also a way you can choose colors. But this one is a very popular, uh, closely related colors. I'm sorry for this red, but uh, they want to have a <laughs> translation to Swedish because this is from the book I, I, I'm working with. Yeah. Uh, and these close related are very nice because then you go into 10 steps on the circle. You can do it wherever you'd like. But if you choose color from them, from this case, and then you also can change the nuances, then it will be a very nice combination. And this uh, you can find very often, actually. And then we have saturated colors, which are uh, the saturation in NCS is described as uh, for an artist because he is working with a black scale. So you go from black out to the high chromatic one. And this then the scale will look like this. And then we have the lightness contrast is also shown in NCS. Uh, because normally you see the lines go like this, but then we have this yellow, which because the light uh, uh, yellow color is a light color in itself, and a blue color is dark in itself, so they go different ways in the triangle, the lightness. Okay, and the lightness contrast requirements in official building is very, very important that you have, so you find the right right place. This actually is from a, a hotel uh, at Deju Island where we stayed. <laughs> and if I, I don't think that these flowers will, should be there, but I mean, if they look at this place without flowers, that will be very difficult to find. Okay, the elevator, I should go here. And then the, it was very difficult to find because everything was like one unit. And that is not allowed in, in Sweden in, in official buildings. And then very close to that, we talk about border distinctness and legibility. Uh, like you see on uh, when we have a package and we should read uh, the content of it. And then we have choose one uh, light green and then they use white text to it. It's very, very difficult to read because the legibility is so bad. As you can see here, the, uh, yellow to this gray is very difficult, but red to white is a very good one. But the best is black and yellow, and that's why the warning signs are that color. And in uh, number six chapter, that's about color naming, the color and language, color similes, paint material names, fantasy name, mapping the most common color words, and color naming study on the internet. That is that chapter. And I just want to give you one example, and that is turquoise, because everyone knows orange, purple, uh, olive green, but turquoise, where is turquoise? There's no in the middle of it here that we call turquoise, like orange. And it's always it's a discussion. So I never say a turquoise color. I say a bluish green or a greenish blue, because otherwise people say, oh no, that is not turquoise. And it's a whole way from, from here, blue to green, that people name, could name them these colors for turquoise. And that is a big discussion we, we have had on the courses, what is turquoise? So that is very interesting, actually. So it's better to say bluish green or greenish blue, because then that will be no discussion. <clears throat> And then chapter seven, what colors signify? Uh, that's about color associations, individual, culture, and general preferences, and meanings and associations of color. And there is a lot of books about what colors signify, named color psychology. And I would say, like uh, Lars Schivik says, all color psycho psychological questions cannot be investigated. Most of them can be answered with common sense, use common sense. There's no reason, however, neither or demin diminish the importance of color nor subscribe them to much of weird psychological meaning. <laughs> so I think that is something in between. And also Werner Panton, Danish architect and designer, he said, Choosing color should not be a gamble. 
it should be a conscious decision because colors have meaning and function. So about here, uh, we talk about uh, the associations of color and there I give some different examples of um, uh, uh, associations. And we have this one is about identity colors and we have the cash uh, ATM machine you call it. Uh, it was actually got this bluish, <laughs> greenish blue color, 1978, and it has lost. So it's the same color today. And th there was an investigation about how you associate this color to words like like, dislike, uh, uh, modern, old fashioned, ugly, beautiful, exciting, soothing negative, positive, and the, all the market, 10 heads of marketing from the biggest commercial banks were asked to fill in uh, because they have four color suggestions. And this one was the, the one that they thought, okay, this will tell our customer what we want the customer to feel when they are standing at the ATM machine. And it's rather funny because they have all had this color for so, so long time. So that's, that's a good, example of trying when you're uh, experimenting what people think when you are choosing a color for your identity. And then we are, of course, when we talk about identity colors, a strong identity company we have in Sweden is IKEA, because that is yellow and blue, but not exactly as a flag, but it's you associate to the flag, of course. And color and music, because we have about these associations, we talk about color and fragrance uh, and color and packaging. And, and also we have color and music and that experiments we have done on the summer workshop that Jeanette was talking about, but we didn't do it at your time. But it's an American, Seba, who has done this. She has play this music like Mozart's Serenade in G minor from Eine Kleine Nachtmusik and Adagio in G minor by Albinioni. No, now I have written wrong. Dur and Moll. This minor is uh, sad, isn't it? <laughs> you know that. <laughs> because uh, this one is, uh, I have written uh, uh, something wrong here. <laughs> okay, you know. This is a happy music, and this is very mm, music adagio. And then people on the summer course, they had all these paints, and we said, okay, now you paint to this music. And they always painted like red and yellow to Eine Kleine Nachtmusik, and adagio, they were dark blue and sentimental <laughs> colors, we could say. And that was a very interesting thing to do, actually. So we had the same result that Seba had with her students. And then time, okay. Have I still time, Jeanette? Yeah, I think we start a little yes, bit. Yes, yes, you have time, you have time. The human impact of color, that is not, uh, chapter eight, and that is about the influence of room color and color in caring environments. But the influence of room color is both for, mostly for official, uh, uh, office and so on, not you, perhaps room, your own room as well, but what effects does the color of the room have on the people in it and how are we affected by colors? Which colors are good for us in hospital wards, waiting rooms and workplaces? Can the color design support all the people's ability to orient themselves? There are many questions to be asked, but are there any straightforward answers to them? And it's a longer chapter and the, it's about, uh, they had in an office, they tried red and blue. I mean, red is associated with fire and sun and warm things and blue uh, more of cold things. Uh, so they made investigations. They should do different things in the red room and the blue room. And people did like red room uh, better but if they were depressed in so, in, in a way, I mean, they could, something could have happened to when they do, did the research. I mean, that the 
people they met on the bus or something had been not so funny to meet and so on. So you were a little bit depressed. Then you were more depressed in the red room that you, on the other hand, liked better than in the blue room. So it's very difficult to make all these things. But what uh, he says, Jan Janssen, he says a, a preliminary conclusion regarding the effects of color exposure that the consistent harmonious color scheme will benefit the, the majority. In public spaces where many people must get on together under similar conditions, as is the situation in so many workplaces, uh, places, uh, a balance needs to be struck between a calm, harmonious background and more colorful room elements and furnishing details. Color scheme can then very well be used for clarifying functions and underscoring different types of information. But I mean, you have to be aware of that are people, some people, if you are introvert or extrovert, the introvert person doesn't, cannot handle strong colors and strong patterns. So then therefore it should, should be not white or gray, but it should be color, but not so strong color, you could say. And then we have older people. Uh, this is um, uh, where they have lunches and so on in a care center for older people. And here is a lightness contrast, very, very important. You can see that the chairs are black towards a more lighter uh, table. And also you can see here is the wall and here is the uh, flooring. And to make a difference between wall and flooring, you have this baseboard in a darker color. So you make like if you have uh, had a pen, like showing where the room starts and ends. So that's very important in these kind of environments. <clears throat> and we need contrast. So nature gives us most appreciated variety in color and light contrast and colors and contrast, which touches our senses, self-evident in our nature. Nature's different seasons in colors create different feelings. Like, you know, here is a very high contrast uh, on these um, passion flower, you call it. Oh, and it's of course for the, the uh, bees to find the way to the flower. Uh, so that's important. The nature is very good inspiration for us when you make this combination. And here you can see that we have spring flowers and we have autumn flower, uh, autumn colors. But then number chapter nine, that is uh, about <clears throat> the cycle of it is changeability of color impressions. And there we have a lot of factors that we'll, uh, we have to take care of, be, be aware of. Like we have the choosing color, which color should we choose? I mean, it depends, of course, on if it's exterior, for instance, it depends on the architecture and also for interior. And viewing distance and size and form and surroundings and viewing angle, matte and gloss and texture and reflections and shadow and shimmer, color light and space and color memory. And then that is depending on, that's what we will perceive. So, uh, because the color of an object is not constant. And I will not show all these uh, details, but some of them, because everyone is doubtless aware of the difference between the small color sample and the way the color turned out when the paint was applied on an entire wall. When the saying usually goes like this, that color is not the color I thought it would be. The color of the sample and the resulting color of the wall does not look the same. So it's very difficult. Just if you stand one meter from the wall, you can see another color than if you have the sample, if you compare the sample. So this is, this is like an exterior that this looked much lighter, but it was actually this color. Uh, and to show this, um, I have to explain it because this is, if I sit at a table, like an architect table, designer's table is often white, and I choose this color for the wall, okay? Uh, and I choose that 
that one and that one and that one and that one. And what I will, and, and then what I will perceive is that one and that one and that one and that one and that one. If I take these samples, which are on the whiteboard, instead put them on a black paper, then it will look like this. So they will look more like the perceived color I will have outside. So it's a tool to find out how will that color look like. Like this gray, for instance, if you take a gray, purely gray color, that color will always look bluish gray. So if you want to have a pure gray, then you have to have add 1502Y, for instance, that would be a nice gray color, not 1500M, that will be blue. <clears throat> so the perceived color, the inherent color is the color which the building has as its own when you go up to the wall and measure the color with the color sample. The the perceived color is the color we perceive when we view the building at a distance. And the perceived color tends to look less blackish and more chromatic than the inherent color sample. And that is for exteriors, of course. So when I'm choosing color for the exteriors, choose some dirty colors. They will look very beautiful on the wall. And of course, if we say something in, in Sweden and you have another, we have different references. And I have been a lot in Hong Kong and actually help them with the exterior colors they are choosing. And I mean, it's also about culture, but um, these, some of these color can look very purple and very, very, yes, purple and uh, pink, very strong pink. And actually they have tried to have more blackness in the colors uh, the, for the, it was for the uh, Hong Kong Housing Authority, I made these courses and it was for several years, but it was very interesting to see it all. <clears throat> and of course we have uh, reflections, which could be very interesting. And these are, this is the floor, uh, color of the floor, but you see the windows here reflecting in the floor. And then you also have shimmer and, and shadow and shimmer, which make the room also, these changes also make the room very beautiful. Also. Then to the last chapter, um, it's about color inspiration, practical examples. And this is brand also, these two uh, chapters are new from compared to the old book. And we have presentations of color schemes, and I show you different design methods and color analysis of interesting color palettes. Here we can find greenery at the forest edge, the colors of nature, and Scandinavian color scale, color scale from Pompeii, Italy, Corbusier color palette, France, and two color schemes from Germany. Uh, and then we have two color, uh, the colors of Longyearbyen, in Norway, and color of Rajasthan, India, the four cities of Rajasthan, and color palace of William Morris and Josef Frank, their textile and traditional Korean customs, South Korea. So I just want to show you that uh, about the importance of color, uh, color analysis, analyzing, analyzing the, of the existing colors in genuine environments we have done when we come to uh, antique environments, and typical color areas with different time periods, visual assessment with NCS color samples, parallel with the color reader. So that's a, a process. And the visual analysts have been compared with culture color from the Swedish national heritage, which I think is a very nice color scale for interiors, actually. And um, uh, then we have, you also find sometimes, I mean, when you make, uh, uh, color analysis. If you have an old uh, building, then there are, like we had, uh, I will show you a church that I measured. Then there is a blue color, which is okay. They, you can find it many places, but it's not exactly the same color everywhere because he mixed the paint when he did it for a couple of hundred years ago. So of course there will be difference, but the important is to find the right area. Is it pale colors, vivid colors, dark colors, or muted colors? So it, the color area, if you find that, 
then you will have the right expression of the colors, you could say. <clears throat> and sometimes it's very difficult because this uh, is silk, uh, uh, wall pa silk paper, it was actually looking like this, but then they found uh, uh, behind the painting, then they found this color. So that it had changed a lot. So that is the tricky things when you come to old things. But I analyzed color, whatever, in the springtime. Wow, the skilla, nice color, and the magnolia, what a fantastic color. It's really interesting and funny and learning to see. Because when I look at the color and distance, and then I see the true color, wow, okay. So something is happening there. And also when we come into the nature, like our birch tree is very Scandinavian. And if we make the bark, uh, measure the bark, the, the bark is 10 O to Y, which is the most common white color we have in historical. And also that's a very nice one. And then we had 2502Y. So these are very, two very popular colors from the Gustavian time or the Rococo time. <clears throat> and you can also go into look at stones. Cornel Fidel Anker, he, she has analyzed the stones and find that it's area of maximum 20 in chromaticness and almost blackish go down to 80 and white to 50. So this area. I just pick some colors. So, so then you got a nice, nice color scale from stones. So the nature is very inspiration. And uh, this church, it's the Banyu church designed by Japanese Korean architect Itami Yoon. And first thing you see of Banyu church is a ceiling reflecting the light in harmony with the sky. Then you discover the water surrounding the church and it looks like it's floating in the water like Noah's Ark. An incredibly beautiful example of the interaction between nature, culture, and architecture. It seems like it always has stand there. I have more pictures in the book, but that is um, when, when uh, the interaction between the nature uh, and the colors of the house is so fantastic, and especially on this one, I must say. <clears throat> This one is an old church in Harjedalen in Sweden, which we call Harjedal's Rokoko. <laughs> it's a very funny name, but he was a very good painter and I was measuring all over the place. I would say it took a lot of, uh, so we could say that uh, the samples you see here, they are an inspirational scale of colors from this church. So they are the color scale inspired by this Rococo church in Hede church. I think you call uh, the Rococo the Chippendale. Do you think? Are you are you familiar with Rococo? I don't know. Okay. <clears throat> and then we have Litten from mid-century colors, and that is Kitchen from 1960. And we have them actually here. So that's very nice. And this is now written in, in Swedish, the name of them. But I can say that uh, this is gray. Uh, 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 what do you call Dima? <laughs> I forgot Dima. But uh, it's, uh, all, all the names are from the nature, you could say, except for Pjellbacka, because that's a small place. But these are very nice colors from the 1950, 1960, you could say. Not so strong, 10, some of them are 20, the green, but otherwise they are five and 10 or two in chromaticness. That's very nice. <clears throat> and white colors also, uh, white, the white, whitish um, color are a little bit hard to look at, I think, but if you have them, them uh, with a little bit of some chromaticness, they look much nicer and warmer. And this room is actually painted with 10 or 5 white 30 R. So it looks white, but it's not that, that white. <clears throat> and then we have also two architects who made the analysis of Pompeii. And what is rather fun to see is that 5040 YHR, that is actually a, 
or fallen red house has this color. You can see they are rather, they are, uh, many of them, they have at least 20 and um, most, uh, most of them have 30 and 40 in blackness. And the chromatic means, okay, this one is 40, but then you have 30 in blackness and also here 15 blackness. And then they are very nice to see. And then we have the Corbusier paint, uh, which we have collections of color that we have been measuring. The polychromatic architectural, that's what I'm looking for. So we have them. And then we have what Keen has measured in Bruno Taub's house in Magdeburg. It has a very strong color combination. And all these colors you can find in the book. <laughs> and then we have Josef Frank textiles and also Morris textile and made a comparison. And that has also another person made this comparison. And we all come to the same conclusion that, uh, and I also know that Josef Frank, he wanted to hold to a bit more fantasy colors in his textiles. But Morris, he skipped to, uh, he wanted to have the true colors of the vegetation of the flowers and so on. I don't know if you are familiar with Josef Frank, but he is, he came from Austria to Sweden during the second world war and he is very big in our home, homes. His uh, wallpapers and textile and furnishing is very exclusive and can buy only from this Swedish company here in Stockholm. And then we have a glossary with 86 keywords now. There can be some more <laughs> since I'm not ready with the book. And I mean, we have to stop and see and look at everything we have around us. Uh, this is also from Harry Dahlen, Rococo. And the English version uh, are ready to sail in the middle of November. So I will thank you all and see our, from our colorful world, but this is Rosillon in France. And this is the, that more bluish world that I am living in, but we are leaving it because now the boat is <gasps> not in the water any longer. But thank you all for your attention.